right, it's now 12.30, so I'll make a bit of a start. Welcome everyone to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar series. My name is Amy Harwood and I work with the Birch Cropping Group. So this webinar is part of the Southern Pulse Extension Project and the pro this project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the Southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability. So the purpose of today's webinar is to give a bit of an update on pulse diseases in South Australia and Victoria. Now, before we start the webinar, everyone should be muted. We will take questions after the presentation. The Q&A window at the bottom of your screen allows, allows you to ask questions. So if you see the button for q and if you click that, you can open the window, type your question into the box and hit send. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to the question. Now this webinar is also being recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole thing, or if you have any technical issues or would like to share this, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Now let's get straight into today's presentation. I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Joshua Fanning from Agriculture Victoria and Dr. Jenny Davidson from SARDI. So Dr. Joshua Fanning has worked for Agriculture Victoria since 2013. He started working in soil borne disease and has now moved to managing the pulse pulse pathology, soil borne disease and surveillance programs. His work is industry focused and he is passionate about helping growers and advisors manage disease efficiently. Dr Jenny Davidson is a principal research scientist in the Pulse and Oilseed Laboratory at SADI, as well as a science leader in the plant health and biosecurity section at SADI. She has over 25 years experience in this discipline including research, research projects on disease of field peas, lentils, faba beans, and chickpeas. Dr. Davidson is very experienced in research of epidemiology and disease management and resistance screening to the main fungal and bacterial diseases of pulse crops, including ascochyta blight, botrytis, and mildew diseases. Thanks, Josh and Jenny. Thanks, Amy. Um, so we'll make a start. And we're going to swap between Ginny and myself throughout this presentation. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, Amy, please. Um, so we're going to start up front with our main messages for today. And um, I thought it would, it's always pertinent to sort of talk about the main messages because it's going to follow a key theme throughout the presentation. So the main messages that we've got, if only you listen to this one slide for the day, um, know your region and the diseases of significance. So that's why we've got Jenny and myself on here today for both the Victorian and South Australian perspective and a range of knowledges and experiences. Um, monitor for the disease in your own crops. Understand the season effect on the disease risk in your area. So it's not just about your area, it's about the disease risk in that area. What other crops are in your environment, um, in your local district and on a broader scale? If you can't identify the diseases, seek assistance. And there's a range of agronomists or researchers you can talk to um, to gain that experience. Know the disease resistance rating for your crops and varieties. So that varies between the crop and varieties. So having an up-to-date plan based on what you're growing and knowing the latest rating, um, which we'll go through later in the presentation. Have a plan in place for the year. Um, so you know what your disease is. You've gone through all those details I've just mentioned, and then have a plan in place for your crop and variety for each of your paddocks based on your risk level. Have the fungicides on order or in the shed because in a bad disease year, um, you may need them quickly and need to know that you can get access to them. And then finally, know where and when to get help. So know when you're out of your depth and who you need to contact and what their numbers are. So moving on to the next slide. Thanks, Amy. So across the district or across the two states at the moment, we've got very different um, perspectives going on and very different climates and environments. In, certainly across the Mallee in both states, we've got um, very early sown crops. And these early sown crops, um, we're going to go through each of those and where they're up to and what, what sort of diseases to be looking out for and how to manage those. So the problem with early sown crops is that we're going to have earlier signs of disease um, when we get into the cooler months or the warmer months later in the season when you've got bi larger biomass. But we're going to be seeing diseases for a longer period of time across those crops because they're in the ground for longer. So chickpeas, 
There's certainly some advanced chickpeas throughout the Victorian Mallee and the South Australian Mallee environments. So it's being proactive with these early sown crops. Remember chlorothanolol is only preventative. We've got some other fungicides that you can use, but chlorothanolol is only preventative on the areas that it's been sprayed. So if you've got foliage that's been growing after you've applied chlorothanolol, then that's not going to be protected. So it's ensuring that you've got your canopy protected and enough of the growth protected so the chickpea survives. If ascicida establishes, then you're going to require regular fungicides ahead of rain. Monitoring for diseases. The other thing that we've got going on is with these early, early sown crops, we're starting to see a higher prevalence of sclerotinia. And so thinking about other chemistries, there's a lot of chlorothanol that goes out across crops. But thinking about those other bixifen, prothiaconazole, uh, as oxystrobin, tebiconazole mixes, um, looking at those mixes, um, and there's another one, cyproconazole, um, and they're going to control other diseases or going to have some efficacy towards sclerotinia potentially. Um, so thinking about those other diseases, which we're starting to see, such as sclerotinia, come through. In lentils, um, with these higher biomasses, early in the season, we're going to have sclerotinia potentially come through again. Um, and it's applying the right fungicides and getting them before canopy closure. So hopefully the crops that are, have reached canopy closure are going to have that spray beforehand um, or have had that spray. And then thinking about if you're getting sclerotinia and you haven't applied that because your carbendism sprays are not going to control sclerotinia, it's making sure that you apply a higher water rate to be able to get it into the canopy closure. Think about grazing. Um, in our vetch um, varieties, but in lentils as well, potentially. Um, and think about when botrytis may become an issue. So botrytis with these early grown crops, we're already seeing botrytis in our vetches. Um, when is that gonna spread to our lentils? And later in the season, if we've got early sown lentils in the mallee that have already reached canopy closure, then when the canopies get larger, greater and larger, um, as we move through the season and when the temperatures warm up, then we're going to start to see botrytis become more of an issue with those large bulk density and bulky canopies. So next slide. When we go on to vetch, um, vetch, it's about pacing yourself with your chemicals, knowing what the value of the crop is and what purpose you're going to be growing it for. So crops that are going to be grown for manures, then obviously thinking about how much you want to apply to those and what your return on investment is. Um, think about those grazing options, especially with vetch, um, less so with the other crops. Um, and ensuring that you know how to open that canopy up, how to get the chemical in, or you have put chemicals on if you're trying to take it through to seed or hay. Um, Botrytis prefers warmer conditions, but the bottom left-hand picture there um, and there were some better ones as well of um, botrytis already forming in the Mallee in Victoria. So although it re requires warmer temperatures, um, it can develop in cooler temperatures as well. It's just a slower rate of growth compared to those warmer temperatures. So it's going to become more of an issue in spring, but with those heavy canopies from early sowing, it's, going to become, it's potentially going to become an issue when we've got humid canopies and rainfall during our spring environment later in the season. So it's making sure you've put that fungicide on now or thinking about grazing to open that canopy up or cutting for hay before you get to that environment or spraying it out so you don't become a reservoir for botrytis for say lentils. Field peas in Victoria we started with a low black spot risk it was different in South Australia depending on the area so black spot, black spot manager offers advice on what that was um, but if you're looking at a one and a half ton per hectare yield potential then Applying, a rain, applying fungicide ahead of rainfall events um, at that four to eight node stage, even 10 node stage, or just before potting. If you're looking at that one and a half ton per hectare, you would lost just to protect against black spot. I wouldn't be putting, the, putting that potting spray out or flowering spray out later in the season if you haven't got black spot. But if you are starting to see black spot and you are over that one and a half ton per hectare yield potential, then we need to be thinking about a fungicide application in those field people crops. The other problem we've got is bacterial blight and remembering bacterial blight, there's nothing we can do about it in the season. Um, at the moment, there's really nothing we can do. There's no varietal resistance. So it's just trying to stay out of those field pea paddocks once you have got bacterial blight to stop it spreading into other paddocks, um, stop that damage to the crop as you drive across it as well, which the bacterial blight can radiate out from and just hope for no frost events is all we can do there. So moving on to the next slide. And 
I think we're on to Jenny now. Okay, thanks Josh. So as Josh said, there's um, slightly different effects happening across the states and regions. Uh, this slide here is talking more about those crops that are sown in May and maybe even a little bit into June, a um, little bit later than, than the ones perhaps out in the valley. And, and so this is talking about what should have already happened in favoured beans, particularly in those areas where there's a long-term history of favoured bean cropping, we tend to see Sarcosp relief spot. And this is where we're suggesting that spray of tepiconazole of around about that four to six weeks after sowing gives a really good control of that particular disease. Um, also for varieties that are susceptible to ascochyta blight, um, this is a time, that sort of six to 10 week stage, when perhaps the grass spray is going out, you might put out a fungicide to um, minimise the establishment of ascochyta blight in susceptible varieties. Remembering, of course, with your varieties that in recent years, we have seen a shift in susceptibility. So a variety like Farrah uh, used to be resistant, it no longer is. So really important there to keep up to date with what your different resistances are in the different varieties. Um, for field pea, we are seeing a bit of downy mildew around the place that's associated with the cold, wet soils, cold conditions. Um, this is a fungus that survives in the soil. As soon as you get anything that slows down the emergence of the seedling, that gives an opportunity for the soil-borne inoculum to affect the germlings. So it is very much a seedling disease. Um, the best control for this one is a seed dressing, a metalaxyl seed dressing. Um, so it is really, metalaxyl seed dressings are recommended for those crops where there has been a history of downy mildew in the paddock. Once the crop is up and away and you get um, some infection going, there's very not a great deal you can do about it. Quite often um, a foliar fungicide may not be effective or may not be economic is perhaps the better um, terminology because this, most of the damage from downy mildew is done at that emergence and seedling stage. So, by the time the grower sees the downy mildew there, often the yield loss associated with that disease has already happened. Once the um, plants start to grow, once you get some sunshine, a bit of drying out, generally you might lose a couple of leaves at the bottom of the plant, but beyond that, um, it will grow away from it as long as you haven't got that very severe seedling infection. So also in field peas, Josh has already talked about the fungicide options there. Um, if ascochyta blight is a risk and your potential yield is over one and a half tonnes per hectare, then that early spray at the seedling stage between the four to nine nodes is worth doing. Uh, similarly, Josh has talked about chickpeas where seed dressing, for at least a thyram, if not a thyram plus thibendazole, seed dressing has been applied. That really in chickpeas, that's essential to um, stop the transmission of any infection from seed to seedling. And then regular fungicides of head of rain. Really, really important in chickpeas to be continually monitoring for ascochyta blight so that you know just how many fungicides to put out and um, what sort of rates you need to be putting. Because as soon as it's in a crop, you've got to be very, very diligent with those sprays. Uh, lentils, we recommend again for similar reasons that a seed dressing is applied. Um, generally, once in seedling or early crop stage, we generally don't recommend a fungicide, a foliar fungicide application because this disease in lentils is actually quite slow to move over winter and there is time during spring to pull it up. So unless you've got a really severe infestation at the early stages, um, we're not suggesting any action as yet in lentils. So next slide, thanks. So the next thing to think about, of course, is um, the stage of canopy closure. So that is really an important stage for uh, keeping disease under control in pulse crops, and particularly for favour being lentil and vetch. Because what we're doing here, the main concern is um, the botrytis diseases, so chocolate spot and botrytis grey mould. Once the crop canopy's over, those conditions inside underneath the canopy can be ideal for the botrytis diseases to get going. And your fungicide applications immediately prior to canopy closure 
is the last opportunity to get that fungicide down to the base of the plant. And that is your best strategy for controlling these diseases. So as I said, as you're getting immediately prior, don't wait, don't go too early. You can see the favor mean image there on the left hand side. That's really way too early for being spraying um, for that canopy closure spray. And maybe the lentil one on the right hand side is perhaps a little bit too late, but you want to get it as close as you can to that canopy closure so that you're maximizing protection, remembering that whatever you spray, whatever grows after you spray is no longer protected. So if you spray too early and you get two to three nodes that grow um, before canopy closes over, then you've got a couple of nodes there under the canopy that are not protected and no way of getting any further fungicide down on them. So the timing of that spray is absolutely crucial. In terms of which fungicides to use, you need to think about, so the primary aim, as I said, is the botrytis diseases, but also think about ascochyta blight. If ascochyta blight is present and there's some rain fronts approaching, you might need a fungicide or a fungicide mix that can also tackle ascochyta. If you consider that sclerotinia is a risk, then you need to select your fungicide accordingly to that. And sclerotinia is going to be a risk in, in very wet conditions where there's frequent rain events. And also we've found with pulses, if you've had recent canola in the paddock, that can also increase the risk. So think about those three diseases when you're choosing um, which fungicide to use at this canopy closure spray. Um, I guess with vetch, it's, it's not so straightforward. I think with vetch we have, um, because it's often sown much earlier, quite often canopy closure can happen a lot earlier perhaps. Um, and so then you have a longer growing season in which um, the vetch has to be protected. So you need to think about just how long, longer period that you need to do the protection. Um, and maybe um, it, there may be some options, and Josh might follow up on this later, but there may be some options in actually grazing the vetch canopy to open it up to dry out uh, conditions so that the botrytis doesn't get by. Next slide, thanks. So in terms of what to happen after the canopy closure, it is all about weather conditions. If we get a lot of rain events then and wet spring, then there are going to have to be multiple fungicides applied. We have had seasons in the past that almost have not stopped raining. I don't know if anyone can remember those, I can. But in those situations, you're actually applying fungicides at a two to three week interval, interval um, which can be a fairly big ask. But if you don't do that, then botrytis can get away. But also remember, if it's not raining and we've got extended dry periods, then there's no requirement for sprays during this period. So in favour bean and lentil, um, if you're looking at a rain forecast coming in, to make a decision as to whether or not your crop needs spraying against chocolate spot or botrytis grey mould. You look at the weather forecast, if it's telling you that the daytime temperatures are going to be above 15 and your nighttime minimums are above 8 degrees C, then those are ideal conditions for the chocolate spot botrytis to get going. And that's when you would need to be spraying ahead of that rain event. If the forecast is telling you that the nighttime temperature is going to be about four or five degrees, then the risk of those diseases getting going is much, much lower. And you might be able to um, spread those sprays out a little bit further. The other thing to think about in terms of selecting your fungicide is if um, ascochyta is present or again, if you're concerned about sclerotinia. So you need to choose which product you're using based on the diseases that you're concerned about. The one to also be monitoring for in favour bean is rust and if you're seeing the first um, pustules of rust then you need to spray the first observation of, of that one to get it uh, so it doesn't uh, spread any further. Next slide thanks. So um, going along the same theme of what are we doing after canopy closure with our chickpeas, as we have been through the whole cropping of chickpeas, we're putting out regular fungicides ahead of rain events and monitoring for your disease. Remember in this period that the pods are in chickpeas are especially susceptible to ascochyta blight. 
So it's very important that you've got some fungicide um, in the shed or on order for a potting spray. And as soon as you see a rain event coming through in potting, you do need to put a spray out. Again, as I said, if there's no rain, those sprays can be held back. In field peas, um, we have an opportunity for a second spray for ascochyta blight control or black spot control at that early flowering stage. And I would do this if your crop is, has, has a potential yield of one and a half ton. We keep saying that because economically, if the yield is less than one and a half ton per hectare, probably not worth spending the money on the fungicides. Again, if your crop is at early flowering, if there's no rain coming, then you can delay that spray. That spray is aimed at, in the um, epidemiology of this disease, the, the black spot fungus creates another airborne phase um, around about springtime, around about that early flowering stage when rain arrives. So this spray is aimed at minimising the spread of that second wave of airborne spores. So it's, it can be a fairly important one if you've got a reasonable level of black spot in the crop. The other one to look at springtime in field peas is powdery mildew. That can move really quickly in highly humid conditions. So if you, you need to be monitoring for it, and as soon as you see a trace of mildew, um, this is down, white, a powdery mildew, so that's a white type of fungus sitting on top of the leaves, not to be confused with downy mildew, which, as I said earlier, starts in the seedling phase. Downy mildew is a grey, felty fungus on the underside of leaves, so they are quite distinctive. Um, a number of people do like to mix the powdery mildew spray with their insect spray at this stage, and often those um, do come together quite well. As I said earlier, with, the, with your vetch um, after canopy closure, you need to think about, are your fungicides economic? What is the end use of this particular crop? And maybe there's an opportunity there to graze the crop rather than spray it to um, reduce the stand density and therefore reducing the risk of the botrytis. But that's going to depend, depend on what the grower is using that crop particularly for. Okay, next slide, thanks. So um, basically, in summary, that you do need to prepare for your fungicide purchases. Josh said at the beginning of this um, discussion that if we have a high disease year, then your fungicides can be in short supply. You need to be prepared. You need to think about what you require to put out on each of these crops. If you haven't got it in the shed, at least have it on order from the retailer. So in chickpeas, it would be sensible to budget for three or four applications um, in a single crop and especially make sure that you've got something sitting in the shed for that potting spray because you can get a chickpea crop to right to the near end and then if you get a wave of ascochyta going onto the pods you can have a serious impact on the yield from that perspective. So always make sure there's something there for a potting spray. Now in lentils and faba beans, it, your budget for that, those canopy closure sprays we talked about, and then plan for at least one post canopy closure spray. Faba beans, uh, sorry, filled peas, you would be planning for that early spray at that sort of anywhere between um, five to nine nodes, and then that's another spray at early flowering. Um, and then, also think about protecting your seed for two reasons. In pulses, these are a, a quality product that go into the human food market. So it's about protecting the yield for the financial um, uh, gain of the grower, but also in terms of the quality product going into market. Also, I guess a third opportunity, a third reason is the grain is, that's being kept back for seed for the following year's crop you want to make sure that that does not have a disease sitting on it to transfer into next year's crop. So be aware that your susceptible crops will probably need a, a, a potting spray of fungicide to protect against disease. But that last point there, seasonal conditions are key. If we get a wet spring, then all of this is going to be necessary. But if, it, if things dry up, then you can pull back on those fungicide sprays. Next slide, thanks. 
Okay, so the other thing to think about with chemical applications, of course, is to avoid fungicide resistance. And this slide is listing, I think, the majority of those products or actives that are registered on a range of pulse crops. And what I wanted to point out there, the second column from the left, which is the group, the chemical group that each of these um, actives sits in. And you can see there's actually quite a number of different groups. So what we are stressing here is that when you select your fungicides and you've got multiple applications in a crop, it is important to rotate the different actives so that that way we're reducing the chance of fungicide resistance building up in our diseases. Because once that's built up, it's gonna be much, much harder to control um, the diseases out there. So there's plenty of opportunity there, I think, to make selections and rotations based on those different groups. Um, the right hand column shows you which crops each of those different actives is registered in. So that's a fairly good quick um, information guide to follow up on. The middle column sprays per crop is legally what you're allowed to spray of those particular actives in a single crop. So the Vixifen Prothioconazole product, you can only put two of those sprays into a single crop. And when you check your labels, also be sure you're checking when you're allowed to spray these. Um, that top one there can only be sprayed in chickpeas until late flower. So it's not available really for a potting spray. And in the other pulses, it can only go to early flower. So once you get into potting, that top one drops out of the system. So be aware of what you can spray when and which of the groups to be rotating around. We haven't put here the products or actives that have permits, um, but a good website to work that out is uh, the Pulse Australia website, which is written down the bottom there. They do a lot of work in um, setting up the permits in Pulse Crops, and so that's your best port of call to um, to get a summary of what permits are actually available. So we have a question there, if you put a spray on before a rain event, but no rain comes, how long does the fungicide provide protection for? Um, yeah, that's a, an interesting question. I think the best way to think about it is in terms of additional growth. So that the, the crop that you've sprayed, uh, the actual product will stay on there for a varying period of time. It's gonna depend on how much rain comes, how much is washed off. But the important thing is if you've got two or three, assume you've got a node of growth per week, each node that grows after the spray is unprotected. And so that's a weak point on the crop where the disease can get in. We work on two to three week window of protection in, in most seasons. Um, some of the newer products do have a little bit of systemic activity. So in actual fact, you might, we don't know how long they are active. I haven't seen the data on that, but certainly you would anticipate that a little bit past three weeks is probably still um, an effective active there. Next slide, thanks. And so handing over to Josh now. So finally, through this presentation, we just want to highlight some of the ch rating changes that are happening this year. So there's a new NVT process for pulses that's been implemented. And so I'm just gonna flick up some slides on the ratings. All of the above recommendations are based on those more susceptible varieties. In a more resistant variety, you're obviously gonna have less, less requirement for fungicides. Um, and there's new def rating definitions that go along with these ratings. So I just wanted to highlight that these are the new ratings up there. Um, and we've got a new variety, PBA Amberley, which is rated MR for chocolate spot. This is provisional, but it is looking like it is a much better variety than all the others we've got for chocolate spot. But we just do want to flag that it is a provisional state and we'd like to see a little bit more data before we say that it is a much more or is in that MR category where you can reduce your fungicides substantially. Um, but just highlighting that most are susceptible there. Um, to Chocolate Spot and Ascochyta, we've got a few resistant options. Um, we've also combined the Pathotype 1 and Pathotype 2 categories there um, because we've found that both Pathotypes are across both states. Um, so next slide, please. 
So in lentil ratings, again, similarly to beans, we've combined those Ascochyta ratings across both states. And I just want to highlight that downgradings from Sarah Blake's data in South Australia of, say, PBA Hallmark XT and PBA Hurricane to an MRMS. We've still got some resistant options up there, um, but just highlighting those rating changes. Um, and the best place to get these update ratings is in an update um, disease guide. So next slide, please. So those disease guides, the 2020 South Australian Crop Sowing Guide and the 2020 Victorian Crop Sowing Guide have got the old ratings in them, but there is a new publication, the Victorian Pulse Disease Guide 2020, which has got the up-to-date ratings in it. There's also the Harvest Guide. Something to be careful of when you are looking at these ratings, in, I noticed in the Harvest Guide, there's two chickpea ratings. It's essential to look at, say, a local guide, um, such as the Pulse Disease Guide for Victoria, because it's actually highlighted the ratings for that state. In the, in the actual harvest guide, they've got two ratings in there, and one of them saying that for a variety like Genesis 090 in chickpeas, it's rated MR. That's actually a northern pathotype group, only effective in the north, um, so that MR rating does not hold in Victoria. Um, it's actually rated MS in Victoria. Um, so it's important to check a local guide and an up-to-date disease guide for those ratings. So next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit about virus diseases. Um, these are not easy things to control because um, really de mostly dependent upon aphids and aphids moving virus around. Even though we, some of our viruses are seed borne, just the straight seed borne um, infestation doesn't really cause a lot of damage. It causes an, an introduction of virus into the crop, but it is the aphids flying around that will spread it further. Um, so aphids will have flown in autumn and established in your crops, but note that they don't establish in chickpeas. They don't like chickpeas. So if you go looking through autumn and winter, you won't, you shouldn't find them there. Um, and then it's the spring flights that uh, transmit the virus within a crop or to neighbouring crops. Generally, what we find with lentils is that we get sort of patches or individual plants um, and if you look at my chickpea photo down on the bottom right hand side, a single plant standing there infected, that's kind of what we see in lentils. And then you might get some patches spreading out from that. But just how much damage is going on in a lentil crop is still up for question. But chickpea and lupins appear to be especially vulnerable to those um, virus infections with the spring flights. And you can see with the middle photo, there's some infestation uh, in a chickpea crop where the aphids have flown from a particular direction and they've been nibbling at the chickpeas and spreading virus through it. And, and we have seen crops that have looked completely like that with so many dead plants across the entire crop. Because as I said, the aphids don't actually like the chickpea, so they don't settle. They might come out of a neighbouring canola crop or a neighbouring lentil crop or something and they fly across the chickpea crop nibbling as they go, transmitting virus every time they nibble. They don't settle, so they move on to another plant. Consequently, you can get quite a lot of virus infection in chickpea. And with something like turnip yellows virus, it does actually cause death of the entire plant. So there's, there's a very, can be quite concerning what goes on in um, chickpeas. Similarly, with lupins, we can see some of those spring effects from the bean yellow mosaic virus. And again, a late infestation of that virus can cause total plant death. Um, in terms of what to do about it, I think the best thing at this stage, monitor your pulse crops and canola crops for aphids in that late winter, early spring. And if the aphids look like they're going to start winging in early spring, it might be worth spraying before they fly. But if it's a late spring flight, then usually it, they're not going to cause any damage. It's too late, the, the crops have matured, the pods have formed and filled, and uh, late spring flights usually aren't a major issue. But monitoring for what's happening in that sort of late winter, early spring with the aphid populations is key. Next slide, thanks. So just to... Um, finally finish with sawborne diseases. There's not much we can do about sawborne diseases through the season at the moment. 
Um, but basically what I wanted to say is we've got some patches forming in crops in both South Australia and Victoria and across the country actually. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that if you are seeing these patches in crops or you do suspect sawborn disease, there's a new survey um, where we're trying to work out what these patches or what's causing these patches. And so if you send those samples to Jenny at Sardi or myself um, in Victoria, we can then put these into this national um, GRDC funded project to look into what's causing these patches. We're finding a range of pathogens at the moment. They go through co comprehensive molecular testing as well as culturing. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much of it because we're trying to focus on what's happening this season. But if you are seeing those samples, come in, um, have a talk to us and definitely send us some pictures and samples um, and we can send you out some kits. Thank you. So next slide. The other thing that I'd just like to highlight is um, the work by Sarah Blake and myself. Um, and we're trying to get disease samples of foliar diseases. Um, so have a talk to either of us and we can send you out a kit and tell you what diseases we're after. But basically, Ascochyta, um, a lot of this testing done by Sarah um, comes from samples submitted to pathologists all around Australia and um, from good agronomists and growers, which is fantastic because that's what supports our research. And so I'd just like to highlight that there. The details will be on the presentation later or you can contact either of us on Twitter or our phones. So thank you. Next slide. Um, for diagnostic samples, um, so if you are seeing something that you don't know, I just thought we'd flag some of those here. Talk to your local agronomist. Um, if they can't help you, um, talk to Jenny or myself um, or Louise in Victoria. Um, so for Victoria, samples come to CropSafe. In South Australia, they go through Jenny Davidson. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so just finally, I'd just like to finish with those main messages again. And Jenny and I have been through a range of things through this presentation, but really it can be summarised with this one slide. If you know the diseases of significance in your area, you know what to do, you're monitoring for disease, you know what's going on, and you understand the effect of seasons on disease risk, um, then you should be pretty right throughout the season. If you can't identify diseases, seek assistance know the disease rating and how that affects your management plan. So if you're growing a more resistant variety, you don't need to worry about those diseases as much as those that, um, varieties that are susceptible. Have a plan in place based on your variety rating, the risk of the season. Um, have your fungicides on order or in the shed so you know that you're safe with what you're doing. You've got your plan, you've got everything there to be able to enact that plan. And then know where and when to get help. Know when you're out of your depth and contact someone for that help. So thank you very much. Okay, thank um, you. Next slide, Amy. And we'll leave it with you, Amy. Yep, we're done. Excellent, thank you very much, Josh and Jenny. If you'd like to ask a question, please click the Q&A button down the bottom of your screen and you can type your question there. There isn't anything sitting in there at the moment, so an eye on that. Uh, if you're looking for any further information on pulses, GRDC's Grow Notes are a very comprehensive research resource, and also the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring during 2020 to bring you the latest pulse information. We have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia for existing and new pulse growers. If you have any other suggestions or requests for things you'd like to learn about pulses, please let us know. The best way to contact us is to email claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, at bcg.org.au. So during the growing season, the Pulse Extension Project runs monthly webinars, so keep an eye out for the next one. Still haven't got any questions coming up, so... Thank you Josh and Jenny for a great presentation. Uh, once the webinar ends, you'll be redirected to a screen with a quick survey link. It's five questions, should take you no more than a minute. And it's just to see how you found today. If you're able to fill that out, that'd be very much appreciated and will help us continue to bring you Pulse webinars. Oh, we've got a question. So have there been any reports of fungicide resistance in South Australia and Victoria for the foliar pathogens of pulses? Um, at this stage, not really, no. I would say, if in, in effect, no. Um, 
some years ago we did find a botrytis isolate on chickpea that was uh, to, found to be resistant to carbendazone. However, uh, the rider for that is this chickpea crop was sitting right next to a vineyard. And we know that in vineyards across South Australia or perhaps even around the whole country, there is a lot of resistance to carbendazone in the botrytis and, and a whole range of pathogens. So we haven't seen any problems with carbendazone on botrytis in, in lentils or chickpeas or any crop here. So at this stage, uh, we think that was an anomaly coming, coming out of vineyards. Um, the other, we haven't had a lot of testing done in the pulse crops, but I think it's worth noting that there are variable results for azoxystrobin on ascochyta blight in chickpea. So there have some places are saying that this uh, products with azoxystrobin are working very well in chickpeas. I've seen trials where it hasn't worked so well. Um, I'm also aware that in North America, there's quite a lot of resistance to exoxystrobin in ascochyta from chickpeas. So potentially um, there may be some issues around that, even though there hasn't been a lot of testing in that space for us. So other than that, I'm not aware of anything else. Excellent. So if anyone has any other questions, please send them in. Uh, this is a monthly initiative, so the next one will be around the middle of August. If you'd like to be kept in the loop of when these of these webinars as they occur, again, please contact Claire and she can email email you when they're coming up. Again, her email is Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, at bcg.org. Still haven't got any more questions coming in, so we'll wrap things up. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to Josh and Jenny. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Amy.